Over 70 years ago, when I was a young person in the youth group, we had a new minister come to our church and on the first Sunday he preached a sermon, as you'd expect. The following Friday there was a boat, boat cruise on Sydney Harbour and he came to me and he said to me, what was my sermon about last Sunday? And from then I, I got into the habit of trying to remember what preachers said when they stood before the congregation. Now this morning I want to make it very easy for you. All I want you to do is to remember two sentences. Not only that, I will tell you when I want you to start to remember them. And to make it easier, there are just 16 words in each sentence. Before we get to that, did you notice anything strange or anything unusual or anything similar about the two readings we had? Two men on a boat, a wild storm, and both men are asleep and the crew are scared. Well, I could have preached a sermon on the peace of godlessness and the peace of God, but I decided not to do that. And so here's the first sentence, 16 words. The ship that carries Jesus is as likely to be tossed by storms as any other. Now let's take a deep breath there, because that goes against the orthodox position of the Old Testament. And it was this, if you were good, you would be healthy, wealthy, and have lots of children. And if you were bad, you would be sick and poor and childless. But of course, we're faced with that as a theory rather than as something that happens in real life. And we could make it very simple by simply asking the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And I guess most of us at some time or other have said just that. Jesus once said to the crowd as he talked to them, do you think that those people that Pilate killed were any worse or any better than those that weren't killed? Do you think that the Tower of Siloam, which fell and killed 18 people, were those 18 people better or worse than those that survived? And so during this past week, I've been reading the book of Job, the oldest book in the Bible, and it asks the question, why must Job suffer? Why should such misfortune come to this God-fearing man? Now, in the New Testament, James talks about the patience of God. I say the, the patience of Job, but with all due respect to James, he got it wrong. There's nothing very patient about Job. Rather, it's a, a violent revolt against the way that God treats people. And so it's no longer possible to hold fast the balanced simplicities of the traditional faith. God meets out terrible and sure disaster for rebellion and he gives peace and power and measureless bounty for obedience. That doesn't happen in real life. Some years ago, I interviewed the mother of one of Australia's great basketball players. He had died of a, a cancer when he was just a young man. And as I was talking to her, she said to me, when it first happened, I said to myself, why me? And then I thought about it for a while and I thought, why not me? In this kind of world, the good and the bad suffer. One night some years ago, a friend of mine knocked on the door and said, hey, we're going to church tonight. A different kind of church than ones I usually go to, but off we went. And there, were a group of, uh, there was a group of evangelists from overseas. And in the course of his sermon, one of them said this, I would be ashamed to go back to my town in America. Ashamed because I drive a Cadillac 
The suit that I wear costs me $1,000. My shoes cost me $500. And that's all happened to me because I love God. And that can happen for you. Well, I remember that uh, back in the bushfires in the Blue Mountains some years ago, the local service station was left standing and the Baptist church was burnt down. And then in Victoria, a storm at, Millua, a storm at uh, the Millua Vineyard wrecked it and left the Anglican church standing. So which is the act of God? Well, you say, what about Psalm 91? A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not touch you. For the Lord is a safe retreat. No disaster shall befall you, for he has charged his angels to guard you wherever you go, to lift you up on their hands for fear you should strike your feet against a stone. But remember, Jesus rejected Satan's use of that part of the Bible. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. In a world like ours, the good person is quite as likely to suffer as the bad. Jesus may be on board the ship, but that doesn't stop the storm. The ship that carries Jesus is as likely to be tossed by storms as any other. The second thing I want to say is that this is the greatest test of our faith. Jesus is asleep in the stern of the ship while the storm is raging. And the terrified disciples cry out, don't you care? And so people say, well, it may be that I have to suffer, but at least God might appear to be concerned. Thomas Carlyle must have been having a bad day because he once said, I could believe in a God who does something, but God does nothing. And it would be easier to weather the storm if Jesus is awake. But what about when it seems that the heavens are made of brass and God is listening and God doesn't care. There was one line of thought, we called it deism, which said that God created the world, withdrew, wound up the clock and now lets it run down. He's the absentee landlord, the absentee God sitting idle ever since creation and just watching our universe, just watching and doing nothing. Oh, I'm sure that you could say there were times in your life when you cried unto the Lord and he heard you and delivered you from all your troubles. But there were also times when the world went on with menacing indifference. It seemed there was no answer, no answer from God and you had the feeling that no one cared. Well, remember Jesus had a moment like that. One hot afternoon, the clouds were gathering and the sun was blotted out. And as he hung dying on a cross, the crowd jeered and they said, he trusted in God that he would deliver him and nothing happened. Nothing. Just an exhausted human figure dying there and that haunting cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If ever God should have done something, it was then. But there was nothing, just darkness and silence. And so I sympathise with a little boy who said, if God had been there, he wouldn't have let them do it. So whatever else we may think, be sure of this. Jesus knows what it's like to feel that no one cares. And finally, and get ready for the next 16 words, Jesus doesn't rebuke the disciples for being afraid, but he does condemn their panic. Now, it's inevitable in life that we will be at times afraid. Fear is an important human emotion. 
We avoid doing certain things because we're afraid of what may happen. We warn our children about crossing the road, about praying with electricity, about swimming in deep water when they're not able to do that. But panic shows that we are lacking in faith. So here's my second sentence. Instead of rushing to communicate our panic to him, let Jesus communicate his peace to us. But what do I mean by peace? There was once a painting competition in which the artist had to depict what they thought peace was. And you can imagine the kind of paintings that they, that they painted, besides still waters, green pastures. But the painting that won was of a raging storm and in the cleft of a rock on top of a cliff, there was a mother bird sitting on her nest. At peace in the midst of the storm. And we might say that peace is the absence of friction in a world that is churning around. Jesus knows the ship will be buffeted by storms. He knows we will encounter heavy seas, but we never need never be away a doubt of the final outcome. What did he say? When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, and may I suggest suffering and pain, to those who have faith, lift up your heads because your redemption is near. The one asleep in the boat proves to be the master. He intervenes and show he has, shows he has the whole world in his hands. Do you need proof? Well, this is a world which has Bethlehem among its villages and Gethsemane among its gardens and Calvary among its hills. And knowing this, could we ever really think that God will abandon us or that God does not care. Remember, the ship that carries Jesus is as likely to be tossed by storms as any other. But when the storms come, instead of rushing to communicate our panic to him, let Jesus communicate his peace to us. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> We bring before you, O God, the sacred and the secular, our work and our worship. And as Jesus used bread and wine to show forth your presence, help us to use money to create a reconciling and redeeming community. The prayers for ourselves and for others, and during this week I've been reading again the articles in the age about the treatment of our indigenous people. And so I want to use part of that in the prayer today. Oh God, our hope is in you. We pray for your strength and grace to forgive, accept and love one another as you love us and forgive us. Give us the courage to accept the realities of our history so that we may build a better future for our nations. Teach us to respect all cultures. Teach us to care for our land and waters. Help us to share justly the resources of this land and help us to bring about spiritual and social change to improve the quality of life for all groups in our community, especially the disadvantaged. Now prayers for others. Oh God, our Father, as we move out of this lockdown, we pray again for our carers, our medical staff. We pray for those who have been so sacrificial in their giving. And we pray that those who have experienced pain during the lockdown 
will know some measure of relief. We pray for people suffering persecution, imprisonment or torture because of their beliefs. Lord, your love knows no bounds, no limits, no distinctions. We pray for those from whom we differ in religion, in culture, in politics. Help us to respect their points of view and to love them as they are loved by you. May we recognise that everywhere is your country, so everyone is our neighbour. O oh God, our Father, we pray for the churches at St John's and St Peter's and the Swedish Church. We pray for the clergy and congregations. In Jesus Christ, you called disciples and prayed for them to be joined in faith. Never let us board up the narrow gate that leads to life with rules or doctrines that you dismiss. But give us a spirit to welcome all people with affection so that your church may never exclude secret friends of yours who are included in the love of Jesus Christ to save us all. We ask your blessing on people we know have need of you. Help us to bring to them your blessings of love and comfort. And in a moment of quietness, we name them before you. Our Father, we ask that all who suffer or are recovering from illness may know your strength May they know that flicker of light, the warmth that says you're there. Give them courage and let them know that they do not walk alone. And we ask for ourselves that we may have the courage to face up to things that chain us to the past and from embracing the future with hope and joy. May we listen to your voice as well as to the voices of people around us and help us to see that where there is justice and mercy and love, there your church will be at work. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.